Today we're doing Counter-Strike 2 benchmarking on GPUs. It's actually a lot more GPU intensive than CSGO was, which is great because CSGO really, it was a little long in the tooth. It wasn't leveraging modern hardware. The downside of this, obviously, is that one of the key appeals of Counter-Strike over the year, decades now, has been that it is a much more accessible game than a lot of its other modern alternatives in terms of graphics hardware and what's required. The goal we had going into this then was to look into that aspect and see is it still relatively playable on lower end hardware. And one of the things that we found was there's still some frame pacing issues. So looking into the frame times, it appears to be not necessarily vendor specific, but just in general, there's frame time pacing and consistency problems with Counter-Strike 2, but it does look a lot better. And the performance, at least from a standpoint of uh, being more predictable and, and scaling properly card to card, that aspect has been largely improved upon. So there's some good and some bad, and we're going to look at that today. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Swappable Blade Fans, available in 120 and 140 millimeter sizes. The new Thermaltake fans include three sets of swappable blades, so that even as you change builds or cases, you can ensure the LEDs are always presented on their best side. The swappable blades allow builders to get the fan frame out of the way of the lights by reversing the blade direction to reconfigure the fan as push or pull while keeping the struts relatively hidden and keeping the fan frame oriented one way. Swapping blades is done by applying pressure evenly to opposite sides, then pressing until the click. Each fan also has pin-to-pad connections for cableless daisy chaining, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. So getting into all this, Counter-Strike 2 has completely replaced Counter-Strike GO in place. It has overhauled the graphics, it's changed APIs, uh, and it's made a lot of improvements in general for the engine and the code base, because one of the problems we've seen in the past with CSGO is you'll get this really wacky lack of scaling between cards, where sometimes something that is clearly much worse will far and away outperform something that's clearly much better. And it wasn't because of the cards or the drivers, it was because of the game. And over time, this was resolved and uh, bugged out again, depending on which sort of era you were looking at for CSGO, because as a reminder, it's been out for a little over a decade now. So it has a long history, and within that time, it's worked better and it's worked worse. Now this game, just right off the bat, is much more GPU heavy and they've specifically added some volumetric effects with things like smoke and incendiary grenades where now, uh, mechanically as part of the game, the smoke can be interacted with. And so part of our testing today looks at smoke heavy gameplay, say in Office, the map, where you'll get smokes in basically every hallway throughout the entire beginning stage of the, of the round. Uh, we look at stuff like that versus no smoke. It's a pretty big difference. Okay, so as we get into the benchmarks then, we're using our standard testing platform for GPU reviews. Uh, and we also, as a note, have a charity drive going on right now with Cat Angels, which is a local cat shelter to us. We've supported a lot in the past and we're giving 10% of our store revenue to them over the next couple weeks. So if you like this testing and you want to support us and a cat shelter at the same time, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab something like our coaster packs, our mouse mats, or any of our other items, and that'll support both of us. Or you can just give to them if you want. Let's get started with research. So for the research process, we're going to be using an RTX 4090 at 4K and very high settings. This is actually GPU bound in all conditions except for one. And of course, GPU bind or CPU bind will change based on the base CPU in the platform. But for the test settings we're using for our researching, we are GPU limited except for when there are no bots, no other players, and you're just free roaming in a map, which isn't realistic or representative anyway. So our objective here is to try and identify a representative test scenario that we think will show the actual gameplay, but in a way which is common. First off, we observed no difference between like-for-like -like testing in a replay versus a real match. That's excellent. That's beneficial for testing because replays allow us to represent the exact same scenario every single time. And when you're dealing with human players or with bots, there's going to be a variable that becomes massive to the actual result. So a replay is needed. We noticed that idling and spawn, something we did in T-spawn on Dust2, uh, we produced a 285 FPS average. That's significantly higher than in a firefight, even without smoke. So that indicates that doing a practice map benchmark without enemies isn't going to be representative, nor will just sit in and spawn. We did one such test though. So in practice, solo, no bots, running the exact same bench course as our final replay course, we had a 330 FPS average. 
in the actual test passes, which is the same area, but with smoke grenades and a firefight between online players, but run locally through replay system, we ran at 224 FPS average. Averaging all of our combat tests and even the idle test, but not the solo test, we saw a 243 FPS average. We noticed some extremely smoke heavy and incendiary heavy maps in close quarters, mostly office where uh, grenades are used heavily, could drag down the frame rate. So in this example, we had a 196 FPS average during a firefight with constant smoke and fire in the view frustum. An inside firefight without smoke ran 35% higher frame rate at 266 or so FPS average. Given this range, our landing point of 224 FPS in our bench course strikes a good balance of realistic gameplay, and it's on dust too, so that's important. But one of the things that we noticed, and you may have started to catch on to it in that last chart, is that the game has some serious frame pacing issues. Now, this isn't quite as bad as having micro stutter multiple times in the course of a second or two, and we've seen that in the past, but it is annoying because there's times where on a 4090, a 7900 XTX, a 4060, uh, an A770, basically any card, even at the high end like this, uh, and in the mid-range like with 4060s, we were seeing sometimes frame time spikes upwards of 900 milliseconds, which is almost a full second that you're staring at the same data, the same frame, uh, which in Counter-Strike, is enough time to miss a shot or to get shot. So normally we focus more on 0.1% lows as a comparison between cards. But for this benchmark today, we are not going to be focusing on those for a comparison of cards because they're chaos. And so it doesn't actually tell us which card it's, is better. It just tells us which one got lucky with whatever Counter-Strike 2 is doing uh, in an unpredictable way to tank those performance values for uh, for frame times. So to look into this, we started plotting some frame times. Here's a plot of four runs on the RX 7900 XTX at 1440p and very high. We have the scale zoomed here. As you can see here, overall the frame times were under 5 milliseconds, which is great. That means we're in the hundreds of frames per second as a rate. But with each pass, we saw sporadic spikes north of 16 milliseconds, and actually a lot worse than that. Here's the zoomed out chart. Pass 1 and 4 both had spikes over 120 milliseconds, but two 120 millisecond spikes out of thousands of frames won't hurt an average. Let's zoom that out again. There it is. We had a hard stutter at 730 milliseconds. Here's an example of a 730 millisecond stall. We'll repeat them a few times. That's 7 tenths of a second. It's noticeable. As a one-off, we can discard it. Uh, maybe an outlier. And we always leave room for potential test error or system error. But this happened in more scenarios than just this card, and in more passes. To show that this isn't just an AMD thing, but rather seemingly a game of chance, here's a frame time plot with the RTX 4060. In this one, things are overall steady and predictable, until one of our passes blew out the chart scale. This is the zoomed out version of the chart. We have a frame time spike to 900 milliseconds, which means as a player, you're staring at the same frame for nearly one full second. In an FPS game, even if only one of these occurs in the whole session, that's incredibly frustrating. That's a long time to be unable to get updated animation or information from things moving around on the screen, or to be unable to move or provide input. Here's the RTX 4070's frame times at 4K very high. While the spikes across this run aren't anywhere near as extreme as we saw in the last batch for the 7900 XTX, or the 4060, the card did have more excursions than we typically see. The jump to about 60 milliseconds was the worst one in this set, with each run containing at least a couple spikes greater than 12 milliseconds, or sometimes up to 26 milliseconds, for deviation from the previous frame. Most players will notice a delta of 8 to 12 milliseconds from one frame to the next, so these are relatively large spikes. Still, nothing as bad as we've seen on, say, an ARC card with CSGO originally when Intel ARC first launched, but it's not great. We want to really emphasize here that again, a few of these spikes won't ruin the experience. You'll notice them, but it's the patterned or repeated spikes that become noticeable and particularly bad, again, like we saw in CSGO with ARC originally. But if you look around online, you'll see people are already noticing some stuttering with CS2. Our conclusion with frame time pacing is that this isn't relegated to any one card or any one vendor but rather it seems like a roll of the dice for how the game wants to behave that particular run. 
more heavily loaded cards seem to get triggered the most frequently, which makes sense. Like, for example, when we tested the RX 7600 at 4K, which is an inadvisable use case, but we did it to see what happened, it becomes completely unplayable, and it's not because of the frame rate average, it's because of the frame time pacing. That's the important part. It's not abnormal to have a low average with a high load, but it is bad to have bad pacing when the average is okay. And it's again, not specific to AMD here. For purposes of comparison then, we'll minimize our focus on the comparative 0.1% lows because they're so random. It doesn't really mean anything if one card has better 0.1% lows than another in these charts, because all that actually means is it had a clean run by roll of the dice with Counter-Strike. So the averages are strong. We get to use tens of thousands of frames to uh, create those averages. So those are the best numbers to work with. And let's get into the comparative charts. Tested at 4K very high first, we see immediately that even the RTX 4090 is GPU bound. That's good. It's a big difference from CSGO's messy, at times, horrendous frame time behavior on modern GPUs. And singular spikes won't affect the average FPS here, like we were just saying, because as one spike to 900 milliseconds, even though it's terrible, out of, say, 40,000 frames for the test suite, uh, it's not going to pull down the numbers, really. Anyway, the 4090 still has scaling room, even at 224 FPS average. The 4080 allows the 4090 to lead by about 37% which is similar to what we saw in our review. That's full scaling. The 7900 XTX ran at 139 FPS average, and again, this one had lows all over the place run to run, but the XTX allows the RTX 4080 a lead of 19% in average FPS, or 62% for the RTX 4090. The 6950 XT is only 1% different from the 7900 XTX. This indicates a potential problem to us. These should typically be further apart. We investigated from our side of things and couldn't find any test issues, so we're wondering if there's room for driver updates here from AMD. The RTX 3080 pulls 124 FPS average with proportional lows, functionally the same as the RTX 4070 Ti, and a bit ahead of the RX 6800 XT in average. The 7900 XT also sits below the RTX 3080 right now. We wouldn't be surprised, once again, if there are driver updates from AMD soon, especially seeing the 7800 XT performed down to 3060 Ti levels. Keep in mind that this is 4K though, so things may pick up at 1440p, and it is possible that there's just a genuine vendor advantage that will be retained even as drivers update. Now we're moving to 1440p testing. Here's the chart. 1440 adds even more cards. The RTX 4090 is at the CPU limit, so it can't fully uncap itself against the 4080. The 4080 still has plenty of room, so we can start our comparisons there. And just as a reminder, with the 14th gen launch for CPUs, we're gonna be updating our GPU test platforms to move to the 14th gen. So that'll increase our ceiling for uh, the CPU limit at lower resolutions. Anyway, the 7900 XTX allowed the 4080 a lead of 16% or so, with the restrained 4090 still leading by 31%. The 4070 Ti is close to the 7900 XTX and tied with the 6950 XT. The XTX's lead over the 7900 XT is about 14 to 15% here. Jumping to Intel momentarily, the A750 managed 85 FPS average at 1440p very high. That ranks at about the same as a GTX 1660 Super and not distant from the A770, all of which are led by the $250 RX 7600 GPU. At 1080p, we're CPU bound on the RTX 4090 with our current setup. That's changing again with the next launch, but for now, that's our limit. In the meantime, the RTX 4070 Ti pulls ahead of the 7900 XTX here, where previously the XTX was ahead at both 4K and 1440. The lower resolution is favoring some of these newer NVIDIA cards. The RX 6800 XT continues the plot we saw unfold previously, keeping about an 11 to 12% lead over the new RX 7800 XT. Although the 7800 XT does manage to lead the 4070 here, which itself is about tied with the 7700 XT. The $300 RTX 4060 is also about tied with the 7700 XT, which is, for AMD's card, priced about $150 higher by MSRP. So by value between the 4060 and the 7700 XT, the favor goes to NVIDIA. And remember that each game will behave differently. So we saw some where the 4060 got blown out by the 7700 XT in our previous review. At the low end, we ran the GTX 1650 since we noticed it's now one of the top cards in the Steam hardware survey. The card managed 1080p very high at 78 FPS average, led by the GTX 1060, another top surveyed card at 103 FPS average. The A750 is also just ahead of this pack, 
and it appears that lower end or older hardware can still manage Counter-Strike even with the graphical overhaul. Since we're at very high, there's also plenty of room to drop settings for more frames if you're on something that's not represented here and is maybe a little lower power still. Overall then, the game's graphical overhaul has definitely made it more intensive than CSGO, but it's also shifted the load in a way that we think makes better use of modern hardware. The downside of this is that people on particularly old or lower powered hardware, like IGPs, APUs, or just old video cards, like say uh, from the 900, 700 era, uh, people on that hardware will be the most affected here in the most negative way. However, for whatever it's worth, when we tested the 1060 at 1080p and very high, it was still very, uh, it was perfectly playable. So the biggest challenge here is that Counter-Strike uh, as a game that's been around since Condition Zero now has a long and storied history of players turning down their settings as much as possible and sometimes even running 4 by 3 aspects ra ratios and, and low resolutions specifically because if you're competitive, the part that is fun is probably the being competitive. And so obviously there's going to be uh, a, a lot of sort of opinions on if this graphics overhaul was the right thing to do because probably those types of players are maybe more purist and would rather stay on higher frame rate, lower fidelity. But Valve tried to preempt this a little bit by going tickless, and that's not something we're covering here today. Anyway, from our perspective, the only thing we care about is how it performs on hardware. And so for GPU testing, we think this actually has now become a relevant title for our GPU reviews because it's heavy enough and it's not fully CPU constrained uh, for most cards. And then for CPU testing, we're not sure yet. We need to look into it. Maybe it'll find a place on our CPU bench with lower settings. So then we would have a look at high settings for people who care more about the graphics quality and don't want to play on lower. Maybe you're not hyper competitive. And we'll have a look at low settings for people who are hyper competitive. And that'll be the CPU benchmarking if it's heavy enough to, to go that route. The biggest concern we have right now is frame time pacing and consistency. And uh, it looks like that's going to be probably mostly on Valve to work out. There may be some driver development that can happen here, um, but we're not sure yet. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to support us directly. And like I said earlier, for the next couple weeks, we are going to be taking 10% of that store revenue and giving it to Cat Angels to help them with their move to a new adoption center. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.